Hello everyone. We were discussing valence bond theory earlier. In valence bond theory we have made so many assumptions and we have found that after knowing the magnetic behavior of a particular complex we can easily explain the bonding pattern, how metal vacates its orbitals for a definite number of ligands around it and how the coordinate bond formation takes place as a result of hybridization. Right? But uh, valence bond theory, though it makes so many assumptions, that's why it suffers from some limitations. First one, metal in one particular oxidation state, when combined with the different ligands, may have complexes with a different magnetic behavior. For example, I'm having two complexes of cobalt here, in which cobalt having same oxidation state plus three. In, in the first complex, we'll see with ammonia as a ligand, this complex undergoes D2 sp3 hybridization that is inner d orbital complex and it is low spin. Fine. Second complex of cobalt chloride in the ligand undergo sp3 d2 hybridization using outer 4d orbitals and this complex of cobalt is a high spin complex, right? But why this happens in case of cobalt? Why metal in same oxidation state form different magnetic uh, behavior complexity. This could not be explained by VBT. Obviously, uh, everything is same except the ligand in these two cases. So definitely the changes in the magnetic behavior is going to be affected due to the uh, different ligand attached to the central atom. So it could not say anything about the nature of ligand, how different ligand affect the magnetic behavior, right? Secondly, sometimes Magnetic behavior predicted by BBT is misleading in few cases. We'll see here. Let's take one example. If I talk about nickel 2 complex, which is square planar, that is hybridization D as P2, right? Then let's discuss this according to BBT. Nickel 2 plus having this configuration, this is 3D8. This is 3D8, 4S0 and 4P0. Nickel 2. Now, if this complex is square planar, that is it will undergo hybridization D as P2, then we have to vacate this D orbital. Fine. Then it is very simple according to VBT. According to VBT, uh, we say that for D as P2, electron has to pair up. This electron has to pair up here. Now, when this electron pairs up, this will be vacant and you can easily undergo D S P2 hybridization to accommodate 4 ligand which leads to a square planar geometry. Right? But once the electron gets paired, the number of unpaired electron will be zero and the complex will be diamagnetic. Right? But what is the limitation here? What is the misguiding here? So uh, usually according to VBT, if we consider VBT only, we can generalize this that all the square planar nickel 2 complexes are definitely going to be diamagnetic, but which is not correct. So what happens sometimes some of the complex of nickel 2 which are square planar, but those complexes are paramagnetic ones. Now, how this? Now, VBT uh, makes some assumptions here. This will also be explained by VBT but without giving any particular explanation, right? According to VBT, this can be easily explained that the complex will be square planar, 1D will be still vacated, but how this electron according to VBT will move, will jump in the higher 4P orbital. As a result, a new situation will be in which one of the D is now vacated and moreover we have not paired the electrons also one electron jumps here so here four ligands can donate their lone pairs leading to D S P 2 hybridization and a square planar shape moreover two unpaired electrons are there so this is paramagnetic so what is the limitation of VBT here that in such case to explain this case he is assuming something, but without explanation, how this electron jumps to 4p, from where this energy comes for electron excitation, this could not be explained by VBT. Now, we are also having a parallel case to this, which is also very important, one case of complex of copper in plus 2 oxidation state, copper in plus 2 oxidation state is 3d9, 
right? Now, this complex of copper 3D9 is square planar as well as found to be paramagnetic. So, if you try this case yourself, you will find in this case also, you have to make a jump from 3D to 4P for the electron, right? But as explanation is not given, so this is considered as a limitation of VVT, fine? So, these two are the two major limitations of VVT. Now, after this, there are certain other uh, limitations which are also very very important that number three, VVT could not explain color of complexes. Most of the complexes of transition atom, transition elements, they are colored, right? Except few like copper one, zinc two complexes, scandium uh, three complexes, right? Where we have specific reason according to configuration, right? So these complexes are colorless. But most of the complexes are complexes of Fe2+, plus, complexes of cobalt 3+, plus, uh, nickel 2+, plus, chromium 3+, plus, etc. These complexes are colored complexes, right? So why the complex is colored? This could not be explained by VBT. Then VBT could not explain stability of a complex. When it, suppose the same metal coordinate with the different ligand. Same metal in a one same oxidation state X positive coordinating with L and L dash have different stability in the aqueous solution which could not be explained. Fine. Then next we have that sometimes the magnetic properties as we have discussed, magnetic properties of complexes do not match with bonding predicted by valence bond theory. Fine. We have examples in this case we have already discussed. Fine. So, moreover, one particular case, nature of ligand is not considered. As I have told you in the example of cobalt in the same lecture that cobalt coordinating with ammonia is of different nature, cobalt coordinating with uh, fluoride ion is of different nature, different magnetic behavior. So definitely nature of ligand is going to affect the property of the complex which is not considered by VBT. So VBT suffers from uh, so many limitations, it makes so many assumptions to explain the experimental observed things, right? So, in order to explain certain limitations, moreover, uh, particularly color and the magnetic behavior of the complexes, we have next very good theory called crystal field theory. Using crystal field theory, we will try to answer about the magnetic behavior as well as the uh, explanation for the color of the complexes. So, next we will be discussing crystal field theory.